It has been an incredibly tough time. The Princess of Wales reveals she's being treated for cancer. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. In a deeply personal and emotional message, Kate said protecting her family was paramount. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. The shocking news of Kate's cancer follows months of speculation about her health. Tonight, we'll bring you reaction coming in from around the world and get full analysis from our royal editor, Chris Shipp. The King says he's proud of Kate's courage. Harry and Meghan wish her health and healing as good wishes pour in. We will climb this mountain with you. Kate's brother posts a childhood picture. What we know about Kate's cancer treatment and the mental challenge of navigating it. There are treatment options uh, available and that being open means that um, also says that you're not alone. And a monarchy under pressure with two senior royals ill, how does it chart the next few months? Prince William, uh, there's a lot on his shoulders because he's the heir to the throne. His wife is unwell, he's got three small children. He must be looking at all the various political things that, that the members of the royal family have to think about. And also tonight, one other big developing story. At least 40 dead and dozens injured after attackers opened fire in a busy Moscow concert hall. This is ITV News at 10 with Julie Etchingham. Good evening. It was a message unlike any before from the Princess of Wales. Sitting in the Spring Gardens of Windsor, she revealed to the world that she's receiving treatment for cancer. It was a deeply personal and moving message from Kate after what she admitted had been an incredibly tough time for her, William and their young family. Following intense speculation about her health, Kate spoke of the importance of taking time to explain what was happening to George, Charlotte and Louis before telling the public. It was after her abdominal surgery in, surgery in January that tests first revealed cancer had been present and she's now undergoing preventative chemotherapy. The news comes less than two months after the King's cancer diagnosis and tonight he spoke of his pride at the courage his beloved daughter-in-law had shown. Kate says she is now focused on healing in mind, body and spirit. Her last official moment in public was on Christmas Day. Today, the Princess of Wales chose to reappear in front of the cameras to make a very personal and moving announcement. Here is that statement from Kate in full from beginning to end. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time it has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too. 
as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. So why did Kate not share anything until today? It was to protect her and William's children. The oldest, George, is only 10. But today, all three finish school for the Easter holidays, which means they can be protected and largely shielded from what is tonight a global news story. Shortly after Kate's announcement, the King said he was so proud of her for her courage and he'd been in the closest contact with, in his words, his beloved daughter-in-law throughout the past weeks. There was also a statement from Harry and Meghan, despite the acrimony of recent years. From California, they wrote, We wish health and healing for Kate and the family and hope they are able to do so privately and in peace. The Princess of Wales spent 13 nights at the London Clinic following abdominal surgery in January. She asked for privacy at the time. She got it at first, but not for very long. A few weeks out of the public eye and an 11th hour cancellation by William at this Thanksgiving service for his godfather, and the rumours and conspiracies went into overdrive. None of it helped by Kate admitting she had digitally manipulated her Mother's Day photo, but the wild speculation about her health has been deeply hurtful, and tonight the Prime Minister condemned those who subjected Kate to it. Rishi Sunak wrote, In recent weeks she has been subjected to intense scrutiny and has been unfairly treated by certain sections of the media around the world and on social media. At the White House tonight, the subject of Kate's health was discussed right at the outset as the president's press secretary came to the microphone. We just heard, obviously all of us just heard the terrible news and certainly we wish her a full recovery. Uh, and I think it's important that uh, we respect their privacy, especially at this time. So I'm not going to go further, further than that. Kate has now asked for privacy, including when she's out with her family. This video obtained by The Sun was taken last weekend at a farm shop near Windsor. Kensington Palace will now take action if Kate's privacy is invaded. That said, she may appear at public events if her doctors permit, but it will not necessarily indicate her official return to work. For now, she is out of the public eye for the foreseeable future. Chris Ship, News at 10. So for the second time in as many months, we find ourselves reporting on the cancer treatment of a senior member of the royal family. As with the king, just what kind of cancer the Princess of Wales had was not made public. What we do know is that she is in the early stages of preventative chemotherapy, a treatment designed to stop cancerous cells appearing elsewhere in the body. Just a month before she became a hospital patient, the Princess of Wales was at a children's hospital to see how young people prepare and recover from surgery. Weeks later, she'd be doing the same. Kensington Palace is not revealing the type or stage of cancer she has, but we do know she's in the early stages of chemotherapy. In late February, the princess started a course of preventative chemotherapy. That's when doctors believe the primary tumour has been removed, but there might still be cancer cells somewhere else in the body. It aims to prevent metastasis, the spread of cancer cells from the part of the body where they first formed to another. These treatments can look like either tablets or they're drugs that are injected. It depends on the type of cancer. And they're often given either all the time or intermittently. They can obviously affect the, the normal cells in your body as well, so you can get some side effects. So hopefully she'll be able to manage those and then the chemotherapy will do what it needs to do and then it will finish and then hopefully she will be fine. 
She and William have supported cancer causes, here opening a new children's cancer centre at the Royal Marsden Hospital. Kate now joins the almost 400,000 people who are diagnosed with cancer every year in the UK. Kate going public is very much in the same way as the king going public with his cancer diagnosis. It's saying that cancer isn't something that you, you can't talk about, um, it, that there are treatment options uh, available and that being open means that um, also says that you're not alone. Three, two, one. Tonight, the head of NHS England praised Kate's bravery for speaking out. High-profile cancer cases like this often prompt others to check their health. Many will simply have deep empathy and sympathy. Rebecca Barry, News at 10. Well, it was at six o'clock this evening that news of Kate's treatment broke as Kensington Palace released the video after so much unfounded chatter. Many people found it shocking to hear the reality of the Princess of Wales health struggles. Her message to others facing cancer, as we just heard, was you are not alone, a sentiment directed back to her in countless words of support tonight. Messages of support are coming from all over the world nowhere more so than Windsor. Here, she's not just their princess, but also their neighbour. So sad to hear it. It's just, she's a beautiful woman. It's really, really sad. I uh, hope she gets better soon. It's terribly sad news, especially with her father-in-law as well. What message would you like to send to Catherine? Well, wish her well, and hopefully she will be. From Windsor to the West Midlands, that sentiment is shared around the nation. It's very sad for the whole family, for everybody especially William, you know, he's lost his mother now, you know, hope, hopefully she'll, she'll make a recovery. Well, it's incredibly sad. Yeah, yeah, incredibly I think sad. for any family, that's just the worst news, isn't it? Yeah. And she's got young children as well. They need to, you know, they need to be as a family. Bye. The world of sport is united tonight in paying tribute to the princess. The All England Club at Wimbledon said their thoughts are with their patron and her family. She has the same role with England rugby, who have wished her a full and speedy recovery. Prince William is the president of the FA. The England football manager has sent the princess a personal message. And we just wanted to send our thoughts and best wishes to her and all of her family. Um, remarkably dignified statement that she gave. And... Uh, yeah, we obviously have a very close relationship with the family, so uh, we're very upset to hear the news, but uh, uh, hopefully everything goes well. Oogie, oogie, oogie. Oi, oi, oi. The scouts say she is a constant champion for young people, adding that they're grateful for her continuing service. Outside the royal residences this evening, well-wishers are still processing the news. Because in the US we've been wondering what's going on, and we, you know, I feel like, we almost follow the royals there maybe more than people do here. So there's been a lot of speculation and like wondering about what's going on with Kate. So it's really sad, I think, to hear that news. I was a Macmillan palliative care nurse and I'm now a priest in the Church of England. So both have allegiance to the royal family. So it's incredibly sad. The Princess of Wales has personally thanked well wishers for their messages of support. A countless number that are coming from every corner of the globe. Amy Lewis, News at 10, Windsor. Well, when the King, the Queen, William and Kate all stepped out together for church on Christmas Day, no one could have predicted how much would change in three short months. Two now are being treated for cancer, their partners caring for them and supporting their families while still undertaking royal engagements. They are uniquely challenging circumstances for the monarchy. The reign of King Charles III is not even two years old. The message presented on Coronation Day just last summer was one of settled, steady continuity. But the royal household has been shaken by ill health. So front of house for the House of Windsor is a new queen who represents her husband on the engagements he can no longer make and a Prince of Wales whose priority now has to be his wife and young family. We went through quite a phase when the Queen and Prince Philip were unable to do things very much, partly because of lockdown and partly because of their great age. And at that point, the royal family rallied around. 
now you have the king um, still operating as king, but basically invisible, and the Princess of Wales recuperating. Um, this means that it's a very, very slimmed down monarchy and um, very difficult, and they will all have to rally around and do the best they can. Good evening, Your Majesty. The king is very clearly determined to continue with his duties as head of state. It's wonderful to see you looking so well. Yeah, it's all done by mirrors. <laughs> like his meetings with the prime minister we're all, we're and his hosting all. of diplomatic receptions. Your Majesty, I hope the king is doing well. But much of royal business now will be conducted by two people who in private are helping those dearest to them through devastating diagnoses. Tessie Ojo hosted the Prince of Wales at a charity awards ceremony last week. He was in great form. It was amazing to, to have him. And knowing now what we know about this news, you almost think that how do they cope? You know, how do you have all of that bubbling behind the scene and yet you are, you are completely devoted to service? And that's, I suppose that's also a lesson for us. A challenging, unsettling start then to the reign of King Charles. Building a monarchy for the 21st century was always going to be a difficult test for the royal family. Through no fault of its own, that task is now even harder. Geraint Vincent, News at 10. And Chris is here to talk us through the events of the day. Um, so much to unpack with you, Chris, really. But we should just start with the, the, the raw fact of the video from the Princess of Wales. I mean, in terms of communicating with the public, talking about something so deeply private, this was an astonishing moment, wasn't it? Yeah, astonishing. A bit, a bit of a masterstroke in the sense of, like, she wanted to communicate very sort of personally to, to everybody out there. And don't forget, we've had all this hysteria and rumour over the last um, few weeks. But, you know, Julie, I was thinking earlier, this time last year, we were in the run-up to the coronation. It had been a largely smooth uh, transition from Queen Elizabeth II, after uh, the long reign that she had, to, to the one of King Charles uh, III. And yet we enter 2024 with first the King's prostate operation, then cancer, Kate's abdominal surgery, uh, and now cancer. And I'm not one of these uh, people that thinks this is a crisis uh, for the monarchy, but it certainly feels really precarious at the moment. You've got the Top, out of the top four members of the royal family, two are currently being treated uh, for, for cancer. And it has been a rather sort of miserable time, to put it mildly, in terms of all those sort of, the, you know, the hysteria on social media, etc., about what is wrong with Kate and why we haven't seen her. So all in all, um, yeah, it, it, it feels pretty miserable. And, you know, Kate's now asked for and can expect to get uh, the privacy that she wanted all along. And we'll talk, talk a bit about the family in a moment, but ju just to touch on the fact that it is, it is quite tricky, isn't it, to sit in front of a camera and deliver mm. if that's not what you're used to doing. And it was a long uh, speech, effectively, from a long message from her, very personal and very emotional. Yeah, I thought it was the, the most emotional and, and personal I've ever seen her. I've watched her do quite a few speeches uh, in my time in this job. And yes, she was very personal. It was very emotive. She connected, I think, very, very well. And particularly, uh, you know, at the end when she spoke about, uh, you know, you're not alone if you've got cancer. And so many people say, and we discussed this when the king announces cancer, so many people feel alone when they get that diagnosis. Clear right through the whole of it, though, that the focus is firmly on the family. Yes, uh, and, and let's let's just, you know, think about the children. There are three children there. George uh, is the oldest of them. This is them when they started at Lambrook School um, in September 2022. Um, now, Lambrook School today uh, broke up for the Easter holidays, uh, and therefore, whilst the kids have known about this for some time, they can shield them from all the, you know, because George will have friends who will have social media, and, and, you know, they want to shield them from it. But I think it's probably just worth listening to, to what Kate said again about about her children in that message. Most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be OK. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. 
And just a quick point on the wording. Uh, if you look at it very closely, Kensington Palace said she had cancer, not has cancer, and she's now having preventative uh, chemotherapy. So I think a lot of people might take a bit of hope from that, 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 that you know, that the outlook, it, it, whilst, it, you know, scary, it's the C word, uh, but it might be quite good. Indeed. OK, Chris, for the moment, I know we'll talk to you again uh, towards the end of the programme. Thank you very much indeed for that. A look at some of the day's other news now. And tonight there have been incredibly disturbing scenes coming out of Moscow where gunmen entered a concert hall and opened fire on the crowd there. Russia's security services say at least 40 people have been killed and more than 100 injured in the building, which was also set on fire. Authorities are investigating it as an act of terror just days after Vladimir Putin cemented his position as president for another six years. Into one of Moscow's most popular concert halls, five men calmly walked in and began killing anyone in front of them. This extraordinary footage, filmed by one of the concert goers still outside the auditorium. People being killed at point blank range. The murderers then move into the main auditorium. Hundreds had gathered expecting to hear music. What they got instead was relentless machine gun fire, explosions, all mixed in with the anguished and terrified screams of those trying to flee. This is yet another glimpse of the visceral reality of what it's like to be caught inside a terrorist attack. The dead lay where they fell as a stampede ensued as survivors tried to escape. At least 40 are dead and 100 wounded, but those figures could well rise. Outside, a huge emergency response and what looks like one of the suspected gunmen being detained. Two weeks ago, the US put out this public warning of intelligence that extremists could be planning an attack in Russia, targeting concert halls and public places. In the past few hours, the Alamak website of so-called Islamic State claimed responsibility, saying their fighters had carried out the attack, killing and wounding hundreds, and that they'd escaped. This eyewitness said there was panic, everyone was screaming and shots were heard. Then someone shouted, get out. It was horrifying. The ISIS fighters left behind destroyed lives and the destruction of Crocus City Hall, a vast complex on the outskirts of Moscow built as a place of entertainment. Tonight it was on fire and its roof collapsed. A brutal irony that having attacked and launched a war against Ukraine, Russia suddenly finds that it is itself a victim of an enemy it could not have imagined could launch such an attack. And Raggy is here and launch it so close to Russia's heart, effectively. What more do we know tonight? Um, well, ISIS claimed responsibility on one of its verified channels. And in fact, some of the eyewitnesses, their interviews are not on video as yet, but said that they saw the attackers who were wearing large Islamic sort of beards. So a few sort of jigsaws are falling into place to suggest that this is IS. The US, as I was saying in that report, warned two weeks ago that they had intelligence that a major terrorist attack by extremists were uh, was pending. Uh, the Russians I mean, and Vladimir Putin himself dismissed it out of hand and said, well, if you've got anything else to share, let us know. Um, it all seems to have come true tonight. I suppose the one thing that everyone was fearing as it was going on was that somehow the no one would claim responsibility and this could have been put on Ukraine by the Russians. I think that it is not credible much anymore. So um, how Russia responds? Let's see. It is still evolving tonight. Russia, uh, Raggy, thank you very much indeed for that. At the United Nations in New York today, there was hope that a significant shift from the US might be enough to see the Security Council actually unite to call for a ceasefire in Gaza. The US has previously blocked such moves, of course, but Israeli bombardments and the threat of starvation have made this situation increasingly desperate and prompted a change in approach from Washington. Its resolution backed an immediate ceasefire and the release of hostages. But hopes of unity were dashed when it was vetoed by Russia and China. It's pretty rare for a politician to get protesters thanking them. 
But in the charged atmosphere of Tel Aviv, the US Secretary of State has given hope to those Israelis who want a deal to ensure hostages are freed. He met the Israeli Prime Minister and War Cabinet today, reportedly giving them some hard truths, warning their place in the world was in peril. Before he left, he again advised Israel not to start a military operation in Rafa, where more than a million displaced Gazans are sheltering. We have the same goals, the defeat of Hamas, Israel's long-term security, but a major ground operation in Rafa is not, in our judgment, the way to achieve it. And, uh, you know, we've been very clear about that. But despite the diplomatic pressure, Benjamin Netanyahu appears determined to press ahead. We have no way to defeat Hamas without going into Rafah and eliminating the rest of the battalions there. I hope we will do it with the support of the U.S., but if we have to, we will do it alone. Former State Department senior advisor on Arab-Israeli negotiations, Aaron David Miller, says the relationship between Netanyahu and Biden is under strain like never before. I call it a crisis of confidence. because I think the president is no longer dealing with the risk-averse Benjamin Netanyahu that he knew and dealt with uh, for decades. He's dealing now with a much more risk-ready, desperate prime minister on trial for bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. Today, a U.S.-backed resolution in the U.N. Security Council calling for an immediate and sustainable ceasefire was vetoed by Russia and China. Partly because it wasn't permanent, partly because it was tied to the release of hostages and condemned Hamas. This was the deadliest single attack on Jews since the Holocaust. And a permanent member of this council can't even condemn it. I'm sorry, it's, it's really outrageous and it's below the dignity of this body. Arab countries were united in their criticism of the US resolution, which came after recent American rejection of other texts calling for a permanent ceasefire. We reject framing what is happening as a terrorism issue. It is a genocide against the entire population of the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip. While the UN fails to act, the suffering inside Gaza is worsening. In the Kamal Adnan hospital, there is plenty of evidence that the most vulnerable are bearing the greatest burden. How old is this child, she's asked. Two and a half, she replies. Half of Gaza's population is made up of children and famine is now stalking them. And we can speak to Dan, who's in Washington tonight, and appalling images from Gaza and the suffering there. Dan, is there any hope the UN will be able to act? Well, look, there's another resolution being put before the Security Council tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. American time, uh, Julie. This time uh, sponsored by Mozambique uh, and the non-permanent members, so the elected members of, of the Security Council. Uh, it talks about a ceasefire uh, for the duration of the holy month of Ramadan, so about another uh, two and a half uh, weeks. It's very short. It's only four paragraphs long. We've seen a a draft of it, and it also demands the release of, of all hostages. It doesn't uh, mention or condemn Hamas, and that may become a sticking point uh, for the Americans when it comes to a vote uh, t tomorrow. But look, diplomats we've spoken to around the UN are saying that US resolution that didn't pass today probably would have done uh, if it hadn't been authored by America, because there's just so much political point scoring uh, going on uh, inside the Security Council. This is six and a half months now since this conflict began, and, and so far uh, uh, the UN has been unable to come up and agree with a form of words to uh, condemn what's going on and, and to try and bring about some sort of peace. The other question, Julie, really, is, is what will happen if it does pass this resolution tomorrow. Will uh, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, heed it or, or will, as, as most people seem to think, more likely he'll ignore it and push on with this uh, incursion into Rafa? OK, Dan, thank you very much indeed. To news here now, and West Yorkshire police are investigating alleged racist comments made by Frank Hester, the Conservative Party's biggest donor. During a 2019 meeting, the businessman is reported to have said Labour MP Diane Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. 
Officers are looking at whether a crime has been committed. Mr Hester admitted he had been rude about Diane Abbott but said his criticism had nothing to do with her gender nor colour of skin. Jersey has taken a step closer to legalising assisted dying after proposals for how it would work there were published. People would have to be 18 or over and have lived in Jersey for at least a year. They would also need to be terminally ill or have an incurable condition with unbearable suffering and have the capacity to make the decision to end their own life. Politicians will debate the plans in May before voting on whether to draft legislation. A man who carried out an elaborate and calculated plan to murder a married couple with fentanyl has been jailed for at least 37 years. Luke DeWitt spent a decade infiltrating the lives of Stephen and Carol Baxter, manipulating them and eventually poisoning them with lethal doses of the opioid painkiller at their Essex home last April. Police described him as one of the most dangerous men they had ever dealt with. Well, let's return to our main story now and the news that the Prince of Wales is undergoing treatment for cancer. She made the announcement in a video which was released this evening. In it, she said it had been an incredibly tough couple of months, but that she is well and getting stronger. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. And Chris joins me now. And again, it was an extraordinary moment. This wasn't at six o'clock this evening. Uh, that privacy now over the Easter break with that family will be as guarded as, as possible. Yeah, you're right. Look, the Princess of Wales has made the announcement. She did it on video. That does two things. One, it makes it very personal, but also it was filmed by the broadcasters, not by William or Kensington Palace. We can tell you it was done on Wednesday. Hopefully that will limit any further conspiracy theories. We can, of course, uh, live in hope. But yes, you're right. They move into the Easter holidays now. I think they've got three or four weeks at Lambrook School where the three children go. And they can, I think they can collectively put their arms around one another and, you know, work out what they're going to do in the coming weeks. Don't forget, at the heart of this, there are three, you know, very small uh, children. You know, I was talking to um, a close friend of William and Kate's just last week before this announcement came back, uh, and they said, look, it will come out, what's wrong with Kate, and when it does, a lot of people who have criticised her are going to regret having done so. And I think, uh, you know, we can see now why it is uh, that, um, you know, that she kept it, quiet and didn't want to talk about it for so long. But we should be in no, no under illusion that this is a global story. Absolutely. I mean, it's not just us talking about it. it you know, the, the Australian breakfast shows woke up. It was their wall-to-wall -wall lead story. I mean, the the American media have been obsessed with this story even before we got to tonight. Uh, they've been talking about nothing other than Kate for a very long time indeed. So, yeah, I mean, this is a global uh, news story. And that says something about not just our royal family and what a sort of global imprint they have, uh, but also we're talking here about one of the world's photographed women and what happens when, when they ask for some privacy they want to step back and and take some medical leave and sadly we've learned quite how difficult that can be okay chris thank you for all you've navigated for us today thank you and we can uh, take a look at some of tomorrow's front pages now where there is of course only one story dominating the headlines the times leads with the princess of wales emotional video announcement that she's being treated for cancer and the king hailing her bravery the mirror carries that same image of kate focusing on her reassuring her children that she is going to be okay and The Telegraph reports on the Princess of Wales appealing for privacy during her ongoing chemotherapy. Well, that is just about it from us tonight. This is the scene at Windsor where the Princess of Wales recorded that message which has shocked so many. This evening at its heart was a strong sense of the importance of family supporting one another through tough times. She may be a figure on the global stage, but in the end and in the first instance, she is a mother looking out for her children. From all of us, good night and have a lovely weekend.